In this video, we will go over the neuropsychological tests which are available if you have purchased a psychological assessment subscription. The following tests are available. The Continuous Performance Test The Corsi Block Tapping Test The Stroop Test Ray's Visual Design Learning Test The Emotion Recognition Test and the Finger Tapping Test. Let's start with the Continuous Performance Test, or CPT for short. In the CPT, letters are sequentially presented on the screen, with a pace of about one letter per second. Subjects are instructed to tap a button as quickly as they can when the letter B appears, but they have to refrain from responding to any other letter. The CPT measures sustained attention and is often used for diagnosing attention disorders, However, research has also shown that CPT performance is impaired in patients with TBI, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. Let's have a look at the CPT in action. Remember, the subject is instructed to press a button as quickly as they can when the letter B appears. In the CPT, a total of 200 letters are presented, and the test takes about 5 minutes to complete. Here is an example of what the results page of the CPT looks like. The top of the page contains general information about the CPT and how to interpret the graphs below. Let's look at the first row of bar graphs. From left to right, these contain the percentage of misses, or when the letter B was presented but no button press was given, the percentage of false alarms, or button presses to other letters, and the average reaction time for hits, or when a B was presented and a button was pressed. In this example, the percentage of misses was 2.5%, which translates into a Z-score of 1.1, which is depicted below figure A. A Z-score of 1.1 means that the 2.5% misses is 1.1 standard deviations above the average of the norm. In the bar graph, Z-score ranges are depicted in different colors ranging from gray to red. Here, the 2.5% falls into the yellow Z-score band, which ranges between 1 and 1.5. The color coding is explained in the Z-score color legend on the right of the page. Figure B shows the false alarms percentage, which was 1.3% in this example, corresponding with a Z-score of 0.5 which is right at the border between the gray and green Z-score bands. Finally, Figure C shows the average reaction time for hits, which was 431 milliseconds in this example, corresponding with a Z-score of 0.6, which falls into the green Z-score band. Figure D shows the distribution of reaction times and errors across the trials of the CPT. Each dot represents the reaction time of a single button press. The solid vertical red lines represent the false alarms, two in total for this example, and the single dotted vertical red line represents a miss. Finally, the green line represents what's called a least squares line. This line can be used to assess whether there is a trend in the reaction times. In the current example, it seems that the reaction times are decreasing somewhat across trials, which is perhaps a bit odd as one might expect that the reaction times would increase as mental fatigue sets in. Finally, Figure E shows the so-called confusion matrix. This table shows the percentages of hits, false alarms, misses, and correct rejections. Correct rejections are trials where letters other than the letter B was presented and no response was given. Next, we turn to the Corsi block tapping test which measures working memory. In the Corsi block tapping test, an array of colored blocks is shown on the screen. One by one, the blocks can change color in sequences of increasing length. When a sequence is complete, the subject is instructed to try and reproduce the sequence by clicking on the correct blocks in the correct order. The Corsi block tapping test starts out with a sequence of only two blocks. When the subject correctly reproduces the sequence at least two out of three trials, the sequence is increased with one block. The sequence with the highest number of blocks that can successfully be reproduced by the subject in two out of three trials is called the Corsi span. The Corsi block tapping test is a measure of visuospatial working memory. 
Working memory has been mainly associated with the frontal cortex, and impaired performance on the Corsi block tapping test has been demonstrated in patients with frontal lesions, psychotic disorders, and depression. However, performance on the Corsi block tapping test also relies on the integrity of the parietal cortex and the hippocampus, which have been associated with the processing of visuospatial information and memory processing. Let's have a look at the Corsi block tapping test in action. Here we have a sequence of four blocks, which is successfully reproduced by the subject. The next video shows a sequence of six blocks, which is also successfully reproduced. This is the results page for the Corsi block tapping test. The top of the page explains the test and graphs. Figure A shows the performance of the subject. The Corsi block tapping test has a single performance outcome measure, namely the Corsi span, which is presented in Figure A. In this example, the Corsi span was 7, meaning that the subject was able to reproduce a sequence of 7 blocks at least 2 out of 3 trials. This score corresponds with a Z-score of 2.3. In other words, the subject scored 2.3 standard deviations above the norm. For the Corsi block tapping test, it is only clinically meaningful when a person scores below the norm. This is why the color coding of the Z-scores changes for negative Z-scores only. The next test we'll address is the Stroop test. In the Stroop test, words referring to a color are presented on the screen, like blue, green, and red. In the congruent condition, the ink color of the letters matches the word, while in the incongruent condition, the ink color of the letters does not match the word. In this example, the word blue does not match the green ink color of the letters, and therefore represents a trial in the incongruent condition. In this version of the Stroop test, subjects need to decide whether the word matches the color or not. The test consists of three phases. In phase one, the ink color of the letters is always white, and subjects just have to press a button as quickly as they can the moment a word is presented on the screen. This phase measures simple reaction time speed. In phase two, subjects are instructed to press a button as quickly as they can only when the color word matches the ink color of the letter. In other words, they are instructed to press a button only in congruent trials. In the final phase, subjects are instructed to press a button when the color word does not match the ink color of the letters. In other words, they are instructed to press a button only in incongruent trials. Subjects generally show slower reaction times for trials in the incongruent condition, in comparison with the congruent condition. The Stroop test measures selective attention, and research shows that ADHD, TBI, and schizophrenia is associated with impaired performance on this test. Let's have a look at the Stroop test in action. Here's the instruction screen for the practice session of phase two of the test. Here, subjects need to press a button only for congruent trials. Let's first watch the video and see what happens. Let's recap. The example starts with an incongruent trial. The subject correctly refrains from pressing a button on this trial. The second trial is a congruent trial, and the subject correctly presses a button. The third trial is again a congruent trial, and the subject responds accordingly. However, on the fourth trial, the subject makes a mistake. A button is pressed, even though the word, yellow, does not match the ink color green. Here is the result page for the Stroop test. The test and graphs are explained in the top part of the page. Let's zoom in on the first set of results. From left to right, these contain the average reaction time for phase 1 on figure A, where the ink color was always white and subjects just needed to respond to each color word with a simple button press. Figure B shows the average reaction time for phase 2, 
where subjects needed to press a button when the color word matched the ink color. Figure C shows the average reaction time for Phase 3, where subjects needed to press a button when the color word did not match the ink color. Finally, Figure D shows the average error percentage across all phases. Below the graphs are the exact numbers and the corresponding Z-scores. The color coding in the graph is explained in the Z-score color legend on the right of the graphs. Figures E1, E2, and E3 show the distribution of reaction times and errors across the trials of the Stroop test for Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3, respectively. Finally, Figure F shows the confusion matrix. The next test we will address measures long-term memory, or immediate visual memory span, to be precise. This test is based on the Ray's Visual Design Learning Test and consists of two parts. In Part 1, 15 abstract figures are sequentially presented on the screen, and the subject is instructed to try to remember these figures because they will be tested on them later on in Part 2 of the experiment. In Part 2, 30 abstract figures are sequentially presented, of which 15 have been presented in Part 1, the subject needs to decide whether a figure was previously presented or not by pressing a button. Impaired performance on the long-term memory test has been demonstrated in patients suffering from neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Generally speaking, impaired long-term memory is associated with lesions in either the temporal lobes, the hippocampus, or both. Finally, Long-term use of psychoactive substances, like MDMA or cannabis, can also lead to impaired long-term memory performance. Let's have a look at Part 1 of the Long-Term Memory Test. Here, subjects need to try to remember the abstract figures that are presented on the screen. We are going to show you just a few examples of Part 1 of the experiment here. Now, let's have a look at the second part of the test. Here, subjects are instructed to press the spacebar when they recognize a figure. Again, we will only show you a couple of trials as an example. This is the result page for the long-term memory test. The top of the page contains general information about the test and the graphs. The primary outcome measure is the percentage of errors, depicted in figure A. Let's zoom in on that figure. As you can see, the error percentage in this example was 16.7% which corresponds with a Z-score of negative 1. Again, the color coding is explained in the Z-score color legend on the right of the graph. Figure B shows the distribution of the false alarms and misses across trials, and Figure C shows the confusion matrix. The next test is the Emotion Recognition Test. In this test, short movie clips are shown, which show a neutral face that slowly morphs into one of six emotional expressions. The possible emotional expressions are anger, disgust, happy, sad, surprise, and fear. The difficulty of each trial differs depending on whether the transition is shown fully or whether only part of the transition is shown. Subjects are instructed to select the correct emotional expression after each trial. Research shows that performance on the emotion recognition test is impaired in autism spectrum disorder and in patients with ventromedial frontal lobe lesions. Patients suffering from a post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, or psychotic disorders have also been shown to have altered recognition performance on specific subsets of facial expressions. Let's watch the emotion recognition test in action. As you can see, when the transition is only partial, recognizing the emotional expression can be really hard. Next, we have the result page for the emotion recognition test. The top of the page explains the test and graphs. Let's zoom in on the results. The six bar graphs show the error percentages for each emotion. Here, the color of the bar corresponds with a Z-score category that is explained in the Z-score color legend on the right. What stands out from these results is that the error percentages for fear and surprise are relatively high, 
but the z-scores are quite low, illustrating that most people find it difficult to dissociate facial expressions of fear and surprise. The final test that will be discussed is the finger tapping test. This is a very simple test in which subjects are instructed to tap a button as fast as they can with either their left or right hand for 10 seconds. The test consists of seven trials, where trial one is a practice trial. Trials two through four are trials in which the subject needs to tap with their right hand, and trials five through seven are trials in which the subject needs to tap with their left hand. Impaired performance on the finger tapping test has been shown for patients suffering from motor dysfunctions as a result from, for example, TBI, Parkinson's disease, or stroke. Let's have a look at the finger tapping test in action. You can see there's a countdown on the screen that counts down from 10 to 0. After that, the subject is instructed to stop tapping. Here's the result page for the finger tapping test. The top of the page contains general information about the test and the graphs. Let's zoom in on the first row of figures. Figure A shows the average number of taps for trials 2 to 4, where the right hand was used. Figure B shows the average number of taps for the left hand, and Figure C shows the total number of taps for right and left hand combined. As you can see, the performance in this example seems to be impaired, since both right and left-handed taps deviate more than two standard deviations from the norm. However, when we look at the number of taps per trial, there seems to be large differences, especially for the right-handed taps. In the second trial, the number of taps was 52, which corresponds with a z-score of negative 0.9, while in the third trial, the number of taps was 25, which corresponds with a z-score of negative 3.7. Such large differences warrant further investigation, and perhaps it would be wise to have the patient do the test again. This concludes the instructional video on the cognitive tests that are available in the Psychological Assessment subscription. Thank you for watching.